So good afternoon. Um, my name is Izzy Plyright. And I'm Bailey Allen. And we are graduate coordinators at the Lehman Center for American History. The Lehman Center for American History is a collaboration between the Rare Books and Manuscripts Library and the Department of History, dedicated to supporting and enhancing the study and teaching of history here at Columbia. We want to welcome you to the second event in a new book talk series at the Lehman Center entitled Historians in the Archives. We created this series to stimulate conversations between scholars and graduate students about how to do the actual work of writing history. Each scholar has their own experiences in the archive, and we wanted to bring those stories to light. We are thrilled to have with us today, Eric Herstal, who is an assistant professor of history at the University of Utah. His research focuses on slavery and abolition, science, medicine, and technology, African-American history, and early United States history. Today, we'll, we will be discussing Eric's newly published work called The Science of Abolition, how slaveholders became the enemies of progress. In the context of slavery, science is usually associated with slaveholder scientific justifications of racism, but abolitionists were equally adept at using scientific ideas to discredit slaveholders. Looking beyond the science of race, the science of abolition shows how black and white scientists and abolitionists drew upon a host of scientific disciplines from chemistry, botany, and geology to medicine and technology to portray slaveholders as the enemies of progress. And on a personal note, uh, I met Eric a couple of years ago in 2018. I was trying to decide which graduate program to enter and he very graciously talked to me about Columbia and our shared advisor. So I am very grateful for him for kind of introducing me to the world of graduate studies. And I am incredibly excited to talk about this wonderful book. So Eric, if you will go ahead and share with us about the science of abolition. Absolutely. So um, thank you, uh, Bailey and Izzy, for that wonderful introduction, and also everybody at the Lehman Center, um, both of you as well, for, for making this possible, and everybody out there um, who's listening to this. Uh, this is a wonderful um, opportunity for me, again, so I'm, I'm just grateful for this. Um, so what I'm going to do is uh, I have my slides here, as you guys can see, and I'm just going to read uh, a kind of you know prepared talk which summarizes the main argument of the book and sort of fleshes out some details. Um, it should take about 25 minutes um, and then from what I understand we'll turn it over to a to a Q&A for the rest for the remainder of the time. So first let me organize my uh, screen and everything accordingly. Okay. Um, so to begin. Throughout the summer of 1851, thousands of spectators withstood sweltering heat in London's Hyde Park, waiting to enter the Crystal Prep Palace, an enormous glass structure that had been built for that year's Great Exhibition. A predecessor to the World's Fair, the Great Exhibition functioned as a kind of showcase for the day's most promising scientific intervention, ones that the exhibition's promoters thought would offer hope for humanity's future. Britain had, ab had abolished slavery uh, 13 years earlier and now positioned itself as the global leader in the international fight against slavery. And perhaps unsurprisingly, the most talked about invention at the Great Exhibition was a new chemical bath for flax fiber whose inventors marketed as a technological solution to slavery. If independent farmers in the American mid and Midwest and Ireland cultivated flax, the inventors claimed, this chemical machine would turn flax into a cheaper alternative to slave-grown American cotton, effectively putting slaveholders out of business. Quote, the abolition of slavery will be greatly accelerated by the success of this machine, wrote one of the machine's uh, inventors, uh, who was a chemist, a chemistry professor at London's Royal Polytechnic Institute. The chemical flax machine won a top prize at that year's great exhibition, and anti-slavery supporters in the United States, both radical abolitionists and more cautious white anti-slavery moderates, wasted no time in heralding cotton's doom. Quote, science is king, not cotton, wrote the New England farmer. Fugitive slaves should be standing in the front ranks of this experiment, declared Henry Bibb, a fugitive African-American living in British Canada. The chemical 
uh, the chemical flax machine was in fact only one of a much broader array of scientific ideas and technological inventions that British and American scientists, as well as black and white abolitionists, used to discredit the institution of slavery. From the birth of the organized abolitionist movement in the 1770s and through British emancipation in the 1830s and the American Civil War, anti-slavery men of science and black and white abolitionists routinely portrayed slaveholders as scientifically inept and technologically unsophisticated, in short, the enemies of progress. And yet this image of slaveholders as the enemies of progress and the enemies of science tends not to be the first association we have regarding the relationship between slavery and science in particular. If anything, historians generally assume that insofar as scientific knowledge mattered in the debates over slavery, it was slaveholders and not abolitionists who dominated the era's scientific discourse. In this telling, discussions of racial science take center stage, with many scholars believing that slaveholders effectively won the scientific debate, given how common, how ubiquitous racist racial science was during, um, uh, during this period. Yet one of the core arguments of my book is that if we look beyond racial science and instead survey scientific arguments in their broadest sense, from ideas rooted in natural history, botany, and medicine, to, te to technological inventions, geology, and even astronomy, an entirely different picture emerges. Rather than playing mere defense, abolitionists were more often than not on the scientific offensive and they were particularly successful at wedding the image of science to the cause of abolition. Appreciating, appreciating abolitionist scientific arguments, or what I call the science of abolition, matters not only because it challenges the common assumption that, it's, that enslavers vis-a-vis -vis racial science dominated the scientific debates over slavery. It matters because scientific arguments played a pivotal role in legitimizing the anti-slavery movement which was particularly important in an era in which science was gaining cultural prestige and when abolitionists were trying to move beyond its parochial and moral claim. And secondly, this science of abolition matters because the scientific case against slavery helps explain where the myth of slavery's backwardsness comes from. That is the idea that slaveholders were hidebound aristocrats and that their institution, slavery, was bound to be defeated by the forces of modernity. In this regard, my book attempts to speak directly to the new history of slavery and capitalism. Much like the older scholarship on which it's based, these new histories are trying to challenge, and I think rightly, the notion that slavery had little to do with the rise of modern uh, capitalism and closely associated symbols of modernity, like science, medicine, and technology. But what rarely goes asked in this, liter in this literature both in its newer form and its older ones, and, in, and, and what my book in part tries to answer is where the idea that slavery was backwards comes from in the first place. One of my core arguments then is that black and white abolitionists, along with their scientific allies, were essential to this myth's creation. By marshalling a wide range of scientific arguments, again, from ideas rooted in chemistry, medicine, and botany to technology and geology, they effectively portrayed slaveholders as the enemies of progress and thus as fundamentally backward. Now for the remainder of my talk, I'll offer a brief overview of the kinds of scientific arguments that abolitionists in both Britain and the United States made against slavery. In the process, I'll highlight one of the core tensions that emerged between radical abolitionists, black and white, particularly in the antebellum period, and their more moderate white allies, many of whom were men of science themselves. As we'll see, the mere fact that both radical and moderate opponents of slavery drew upon scientific ideas did not mean that they deployed them in the same way or for the same political ends. And yet, despite these important uh, political uh, internal divisions within the abolitionist movement, what I hope becomes clear is that science was, and perhaps has always been, an essential tool in the struggle for black freedom. The notion that scientific ideas could be useful in the struggle against slavery dates at least to the early industrial revolution in late 18th century England. Several members of the Society for Affecting 
the abolition of the slave trade, which uh, formed in 1787 and was England's uh, most prominent early abolitionist society, were prominent men of science. That included Josiah Wedgwood, best known as the potter who created the Am I Not a Man and a Brother Medallion, uh, but, also, but who was also less appreciated, a chemist and member of the Royal Society, then England's most prestigious scientific body. The abolitionist society also included Joseph Priestley. Uh, I'm sorry, it didn't include Joseph Priestley, but he was a vocal supporter um, of its members uh, and a vocal critic of, uh, of slavery at the moment when the abolitionist society was taking off. And he was also, of course, the man uh, who would later be known as the one who discovered oxygen, though of course he didn't call it that. Uh, and another member of the British Abolition Society was Erasmus Darwin, who was also an inventor, a botanist, a physician, and a grandfather to his more famous grandson, um, Charles, uh, Charles Darwin. These men were among the first to depict science as a great social equalizer, a force that could help eradicate all social inequities, slavery chief among them. Quote, the introduction of machines and free labor would help gradually eradicate slavery, Wedgwood wrote in 1788. A few years later, Erasmus Darwin, his close friend, speculated that, quote, if, if sugar could be made from its elements without the assistance of vegetation, by that he meant if sugar could be made in a test tube or a laboratory rather than in agriculture, there might not be a need for slavery at all. And uh, moving forward in 1825, London's anti-slavery monthly reporter argued that, quote, in no one instance had slavery and the use of mechanical inventions existed together, echoing Wedgwood's exact lines nearly 30 years earlier. These technological and chemical arguments were joined by a host of arguments rooted in natural history. From the founding of Sierra Leone in 1787 through the 1820s, the colony's anti-slavery founders relied extensively on explorers, naturalists, and physicians, as well as black settlers, to find scientific evidence that might, that might prove to imperial officials in Britain that free black colonies could be just as commercially successful as enslaved colonies in the Caribbean. To take just one example, William, Alley, William Allen, a wealthy white British chemist and abolitionist, kept up a decade-long correspondence with Sierra Leone's uh, African-American settlers, many of them uh, Briti uh, Black loyalists, uh, who had resettled in the 1790s and early, 18, uh, and early 1800s. And he republished their scientific findings, erasing their name, in his anti-slavery pamphlets. Writing privately in Allen's private letters to James Wise, one of the Black settlers, in March of 1810, Allen asked whether, quote, any person in the colony is capable of corresponding who has a taste for natural history. Throughout the 1810s as well, John Cazell, a black settler who won his freedom fighting for the British uh, during the American War of Independence, sent Allen several letters detailing his own expeditions into the African interior and providing updates on the colony's bot botanical experiments. In addition to sending Allen, quote, three specimens of medicine that you will accept as from a friend. For American abolitionists, scientific ideas played an equally prominent role. Three of the first four presidents of the Pennsylvania Abolition Society, which was the new American uh, nation's leading abolitionist society before uh, the 1820s, were prominent men of science, including Benjamin Franklin and Benjamin Rush. Several decades later, Benjamin Sil Silliman, who was Yale's first chemistry professor, a leading scientific thinker in the early American Republic, and a member of New Haven's Anti-Slavery Society, wrote a report for the federal government, which argued that the institution of slavery was preventing Louisiana sugar planters from investing in more profitable and labor-saving technology. Quote, the account given nearly 40 years ago by Brian Edwards, the celebrated historian of the West Indies, Silliman wrote, is substantially a statement of what happens to this hour. Basically, the implication being that because of slave labor, uh, Louisiana plantagers were reluctant to introduce the kind of mechanical technologies that would reduce the need uh, for slave labor. The relationship between anti-slavery men of science, most of them white male elites, 
and abolitionist societies changed dramatically in the antebellum period, or roughly between 1830 and 1860. Before the 1830s, men of science were prominent figures in both the British and American abolitionist societies. But after the 18, but I'm sorry, during the 1830s, as the anti-slave as anti-slavery momentum stalled and a series of slave rebellions shook the Atlantic world, abolitionist societies, particularly in the United States, became more radical, increasingly led uh, by a coalition of white radicals and free, formerly enslaved Black Americans like um, like Sojourner Truth and um, and Frederick Douglass. These quote second wave abolitionist societies rejected the earlier movement's gradualism and its skittishness about the question of free black citizenship. Instead, these new and more radical abolitionist societies demanded the immediate uncompensated end to slavery as well as full black citizenship. As abolition became more radical and less respectable, I should note, elite men of science increasingly kept their distance from these societies. And yet, this is important, many Northern men of science still remain adamantly opposed to slavery, just not members of these organizations. And along, and even though they were kept their distance from radical abolitionists, they continued to press in public the scientific case against slavery. One of the more common scientific arguments made by both moderate anti-slavery men of science and radical abolitionists during the antebellum period related to new technology. Echoing Wedgwood and Silliman, moderates and radicals alike argued that new technological inventions like the chemical machine that debuted in that 1855 great exhibition would sooner or later make slave labor obsolete. The Scientific American still around today, a popular scientific magazine that was based in New York, gave the chemical machine itself its vote of approval presenting it before a scientific panel and calling it in its pages, uh, according to their scientists who reviewed it, a very philosophic idea, meaning that it was scientifically sound. Meanwhile, Horace Greeley, the white anti-slavery editor of the United States' largest newspaper, the New York Tribune, wrote several columns praising this very uh, chemical machine, writing that it all but assured slavery's destruction. And from one of my favorite quotes in all of the book, he wrote in uh, the New York Tribune, quote, perhaps South Carolina would secede from chemistry, as well as from the union of common sense, speaking directly about this chemical flash machine. But here's where things start to get more interesting. Unlike radical abolitionists, white anti-slavery moderates, by far more numerous than radical black and white abolitionists, often position scientific solutions to slavery as a kind of anti-politics. That is, they saw it as a way to avoid sectional conflict by arguing that sooner or later, technological solutions would eventually make slavery unnecessary. In other words, modern anti-slavery voices argued that it was better to wait for a technological fix to slavery rather than engage in a divisive and possibly violent political str struggle over slavery. As one moderate uh, Boston newspaper wrote in 1861, the quote, genius who discovered a flax substitute to cotton would be would do, quote, more for the abolition of slavery than a thousand abolitionist senators combined. So how did these how did the radical abolitionists, and I want to highlight in particular black abolitionists, respond to this co-option of scientific ideas by more moderate anti-slavery voices? Perhaps surprisingly, many black abolitionists, despite their own internal differences, chose to embrace many of these same scientific arguments. It was, and I'm quoting uh, Frederick Douglass, an age of science, he wrote in 1854. And this is me now speaking, and black and white abolitionists could either turn away from science and risk being seen as against modernity, which was exactly the opposite image that anti-slavery leaders had been generating since the movement's inception, or they could engage with these scientific arguments and shape them to their own political ends. Frederick Douglass's newspaper, in fact, reported on the chemical flax machine weeks before even Greeley's New York Tribune, uh, New York Tribune, and Douglass continued to report on later versions of this chemical flax machine long after Greeley had lost interest. Douglass also touted other scientific advances in the 1850s that he believed held anti-slavery potential, including a report by the revered German chemist, 
uh, Justice, Van, Justice Van, Van Leibig, who claimed that asparagus had more caffeine than coffee. And to Douglas, this suggested a possible free labor, that it's the same wage labor alternative to slave grown coffee. So why did black abolitionists embrace scientific solutions, particular in light of its co-option uh, by anti-slavery moderates? Well, I argue that they did so for a number of reasons. First, embracing scientific ideas was a way to keep more moderate mainstream white Northerners within the broader anti-slavery camp, given the popular appeal of science at the time. Second, the, the chemical flax machine in particular could help the boycott movement against slave grown co cotton, which black abolitionists often spearheaded uh, by women revived in the 1840s. Third, and perhaps most importantly, free black communities in the North often promoted scientific ideas and scientific uh, education because they believed it would make black Americans newly freed, useful citizens to, uh, to the nation. To embrace science was, in other words, a way of making a claim on citizenship. Quote, where can we find among ourselves men of science? Where are our lecturers in natural history or critics of useful knowledge? Said Mariah W. Stewart, a black uh, educator and activist to an all black Boston audience in 1833. That is to say, speaking amongst themselves, African-American leaders often promoted the need for black people to engage in scientific learning. To be sure, not all radical abolitionists embraced scientific arguments. Throughout the 1850s, William Lloyd Garrison, the radical white abolitionist, routinely denounced scientific arguments against slavery, be they ones that pointed to steam engines or chemical flax machines as possible solutions to the problem of slavery. The core of Garrison's argument was that slaveholders kept their slaves not for the money, but for the power. Therefore, scientific solutions often based in the idea that, technologi that technological uh, innovations would exert economic pressure on slaveholders were destined to fail in Garrison's eye. Quote, it's not profit that makes slavery so devilish, but man's love of power, he wrote in one article. No amount of financial pressure could convince a slaveholder to embrace abolition. They needed, according to Garrison, a moral reckoning. Garrison may have had a point, but I would argue that he also had the luxury of moral purity, something that most black abolitionists had lacked. Many black abolitionists had family and friends who were, who were still enslaved. And unlike Garrison, they felt the daily ostracism that came with being black in America, a humiliation many believed would not lessen so long as slavery remained intact. And never in the nation's history had so many white Northerners expressed a basic disdain for slavery. By embracing scientific arguments, even when they supported a more tepid political agenda, radical abolitionists were not compromising on their principles. Rather, I argue, they were shaping the message in ways that white moderates could understand. After all, it was mainstream moderate anti-slavery political parties, like famously the bulk of the, of the Republican Party, that rad radical abolitionists would use to push through a more radical political agenda. For Black abolitionists, embracing scientific ideas functioned in much the same way. That is to say, they were vehicles for a more radical agenda. Black abolitionists may or may not have believed that scientific ideas would in fact hold the key to emancipation, but they understood that many white moderates in this age of science wanted to, and Black abolitionists, whether they liked it or not, needed their support. If that meant promoting scientific solutions to achieve their goals, so be it. It was true that scientific ideas were used by both white anti-slavery moderates and slavery defenders, two ends that were often antithetical to true Black freedom. But Black abolitionists and their allies never rejected the importance of science to their, mo to their movement. Science, they understood, was power. And with the power that scientific ideas gave the abolitionist movement, they would help set the enslaved free. Uh, 